All right, so those are examples of the sort of principal chemical bonds we will get. And you can get ad admixtures between the two. If you talk to a chemist, they will tell you that what I've just said is hopelessly naive. Right? Because you can get hybrids between ionic and covalent, and you know, there's all sorts of shades in between. It doesn't matter. We need to think about this just as an introduction to what is most definitely um, important for, uh, for the physicists to understand. And that's where we get to here. So if we look at interatomic forces, uh, then what we're going to do is break them down into the forces that will pull atoms or molecules together and the forces that will keep them apart. So the repulsive forces. All right, now a repulsive force has to kick in at some point because otherwise we've got two atoms occupying the same space at the same time, right? which can't happen. So there has to be a repulsive force there. Attractive forces we know have to be there. We couldn't have a solid, couldn't have the bench in front unless there were attractive forces holding its constituent atoms together. All right, so we've got attractive and we've got repulsive uh, forces. And even in a gas where we've got atoms that are, as we've already established, an order of magnitude further apart than they would be in the fluid or the solid form, uh, even there, there are some weak attractive forces. Right? And we'll, even when we look at perfect gases later on, where we assume when we start out that those things are all zero, uh, we'll discover that we actually have to modify that equation um, to take into account the reality that they're not zero, they're just very small. Um, so, when we've got atoms further apart, than their normal spacing, whatever that is, we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Um, we've got an attractive force between them which is tending to pull them uh, closer together. When they get very close, there is a repulsive force that prevents them from occupying the same space at the same time. Right? So there's a, there's a short-ranged repulsive force which increases very rapidly as you try and squeeze atoms together. Right, think of the energies that have been involved in, in you know, colliders uh, like the one at CERN. Huge amounts of energy to try and smash charged particles together, <coughs> which don't want to be together. Huge amounts of energy required to do that. Um, but when they get further apart, they actually want to come back in together. Right, now I told you that curves have common shape. So the values on the y-axis will change a little bit, but always the shape will be the same. Now, <coughs> the first thing for me to stress is that there are indeed two curves on this graph. Please don't confuse the <coughs> two. We're going to talk about the two um, separately, right? I'm just introducing them now in generic terms. Uh, but one, this sort of pinky one, refers <coughs> to the force between a pair of atoms. All right, so this graph is set up essentially you have to imagine that there is an atom sitting at the origin and there is a second atom out here somewhere and we're moving it backwards and forwards along the x-axis measuring <coughs> the force between those two atoms. That's what that pink graph is telling us about. Right, so there is, if we move our second atom out to a greater distance, there is a decreasing but nevertheless a force that is present that's trying to move them together again. Right Now the sign convention here is that anything below the axis, so a negative force is actually referring to attraction. Right, Because we're, we're thinking of separation as being our positive axis. Uh, uh, axis. Okay, so actually if we're out here, what we're trying to do, what our attractive force is trying to do, is pull the atom closer in together again. So it's a force going that way, not that way. So that's what we regard as, as negative. So here's our attractive force. It gets weaker as we pull an atom further apart. All right? So we have a really low density gas, upper atmosphere, right? interplanetary space. Take whatever example you like as a low pressure gas. <coughs> uh, then the force between atoms is really very, very weak. 
there isn't much attractive force there at all. As we bring them somewhat closer together, uh, the attractive force gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So now here's you know our sodium and chlorine atoms coming together, and you know there's some energy to be gained by getting together. That force increases. But then we get to a point where they're actually getting quite close together. So now we're getting to the point where the electron shells, uh, if we get any closer, will begin to overlap. So we've got a lot of negative charges now repelling each other. So the repulsion force begins to kick in. So if we get beyond this point, then this is screaming up really fast. We don't have to make much of a movement in position to get a huge increase in the repulsive force. An attractive force and a repulsive force, the total, the pink curve on here, is just one added to the other. It's the total force that our second atom is observing. So this is the key point where it crosses the axis. This is zero net force. This is the point at which the repulsive force equals the attractive force. They have cancelled out. The net force is zero. So this separation between our atom at the origin and our second one out here, this is what we refer to as the equilibrium separation. So in terms of, you know, I don't know, the carbon and hydrogen atoms in this bench, this is the separation uh, between those two atoms, right, in their normal state. Now these atoms are vibrating around <coughs> because of temperature, we'll get to that later. But as a simplistic view, this now is our equilibrium position where those two forces are balanced. Now the blue curve is showing something entirely different. It's showing uh, potential energy. And we can switch between potential energy and force, as I'll show you a little bit later on. And in our equilibrium position, we've actually got a minimum in the potential energy. It doesn't have to be zero, but it's a minimum. Okay? So we've got a balance between attractive and repulsive forces, no net forces. We've got a minimum in our potential energy. So, for instance, right, the minimum potential energy of this board rubber, uh, if I drop it, is just going to be the bench. All right? There's an even lower minimum if I dropped it on the floor. But it's still a minimum in its potential energy. If I lift it up, I'm increasing its potential energy. So all we're saying is that in this equilibrium <coughs> position, we've got a minimum in our potential energy. Now, I'm hoping by now you've done enough calculus to know that the bottom of a curve like this, if we find the gradient of this curve, in other words, if we differentiate the potential energy, yeah, the gradient of this curve, precisely at this minimum at the bottom, is zero. The tangent to the curve is flat. That's how we get from potential energy to force. Right? If we take the gradient of our potential energy at any <coughs> point, it will give us the force between the atoms. That's the relationship between the two. So over here, on this side of the minimum, we've got a positive slope here that gives us this force constant up here. Over here, another positive slope is giving us this curve going up. Uh, sorry, going uh, away from a uh, greater distance away from the origin. Now, the potential energy is important because this is actually a measure of the energy of our bond between the atoms. This is the amount of energy we would have to put in to now move our second atom from its equilibrium position out to some greater distance over here. So if we were now talking about this as a, as a, as a um, solid, say, so we've got atom here, atom here, and its equilibrium position in our solid, if we put thermal <coughs> energy in and convert this through liquid to a gas, we've been talking about moving our atoms a lot further apart, right? We've been talking about moving them about 10 times further apart, or at least 10 times further apart. So 
ten times that, you know, we're out here somewhere. Yes? Well, look at what's happened to the energy, the potential energy of our atom. It's gone from having, you know, this amount of potential energy down from our axis all the way out to being close to zero over here. The gap between the two is the amount of energy we've had to put in to pull them apart. It's also the amount of energy that's given up, if you like, when these atoms come together or form whatever bond it is they're formed. That's the measure of it there. Okay, so two curves, one related to the other through its gradient. Right? So differentiating one will get you to the other. But they are two separate ones, don't confuse them. I'm stressing that because the number of people in the stress of exams who have shown me when I've asked for potential energy, the force curve, or vice versa, is actually quite significant. So it is worth trying to you know, drill it into your minds uh, before we go on. All right. Now, I'm going to finish on this slide. All right. this, is, this is simply a... <coughs> A thought experiment analogy to try and illustrate what we've got. Right, and we're going to get a long way with this, actually, in terms of understanding interatomic um, forces. And it's simply to, to think about our atoms as being connected by uh, springs of one sort or another. So they might have a different length, they might have a different stiffness, right? and that's I suppose what we've been talking about in terms of the strengths of our different bonds, ionic bonds, covalent bonds and so on. Uh, but nevertheless, we can think about them as being connected by a spring. All right, now that spring has a normal length. So if we put our two atoms, our two masses down, connected by a spring uh, on a table, if it's, you know, let's assume it's frictionless, then they will, the spring will simply adopt whatever is its natural length. Right? That's our equilibrium separation. If we try and move the masses closer together, then the spring will actually try and push them back out again. There'll be a repulsive force, in other words. If we try and move the atoms further apart, the spring is going to try and drag them back towards that equilibrium position again. And that's the attractive force. Right? I'm talking about this in one dimensions at the moment. You can imagine this working in three dimensions as well. So if we've got a really stiff spring, that's a strong bond, in other words. So, you know, here's our model of, of Dharma, right? Really, really stiff springs between the carbon atoms. Um, so if you knock one and make it vibrate, in other words, you put some thermal energy in, it's going to travel through this network of masses and springs really, really effectively. If you've got a weak, a very floppy spring, in other words, you can knock one and actually that vibration is not going to travel well. It's not going to travel efficiently at all through the network above the springs and mass. Um, and actually a lot of the a lot of the really quite high level physics associated with intratomic bonding can be understood in terms of essentially springs. Right? Unless we stretch too far, unless we compress too far, it's a model that actually works rather well. Right? It's when we take it to extremes that uh, we get something somewhat different. So this equilibrium separation is um, important. Right? It's the rest position of our pair of atoms in whatever bonding situation they're in. Now, as we look at thermal energy, all we're looking at is the vibration of these atoms. So a slight change of position around the equilibrium position. And again, you can think about that in terms of the springs. If you knock one of the masses, it's going to wobble around on the end of the spring until it settles down again. Right, it's the same sort of process. So I'm going to leave it there. Um,